In 1972, Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai was asked what he thought about the French Revolution. It's too early to say, he replied. The witticism was taken as an indication of Zhou's, but also China's, long-term view. But it's not so clear that that's the case. Academics disagree on whether he was really referring to the French Revolution of 1789, or just the 1968 student uprisings in Paris, which would have been somewhat less profound. It's a small example which gets to the heart of the Zhou Enlai question. What do we to make of this enigmatic man who acted in the best interests of the country, but stood by Mao at every turn, even when the madness came for those closest to him? Before this episode, a word of warning. This one gets a bit dark. On the past few episodes of Stuck in the Middle Kingdom with you, we covered some of the challenges in modern China with regard to the competition, guanxi and ruthlessness which infuse the culture. China is indeed a competitive society, where relationships matter more than anything, and one-upmanship is the name of the game. But despite Xi Jinping's cult of personality, the situation now is nothing when compared to the headiest days of the Mao years, when even for the number two, Premier Zhou Enlai, things were touch and go. Zhou Enlai has popped up a couple of times in this story, once when, during the Chinese Civil War, the nationalist leader of China, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, was kidnapped, and Zhou went to meet him to represent Mao, and also in relation to the aftermath of his death in 1976. But as the man who played second fiddle to Mao for so many years, right there amidst some of the 20th century's most profound and disturbing events, and managed not only to avoid being purged or killed, but also came away with a good reputation, he deserves his own bit. The best way to understand Zhou or at least my way to try to, is through the story of Sun Weishu. She was born into a communist family in 1921, during the warlord era in China. A few years later, the nationalists and communists teamed up to fight the warlords, but when the pact broke down, Sun's father was killed in Chiang's brutal attempt to rid the land of anything communist, the Shanghai Massacre. At this point, Sun was just six. Zhou Enlai and his wife, Deng Ying Chao, escaped the Shanghai Massacre, and went on to adopt Sun Weishu. Zhou and Deng were lifelong companions, but never had their own children. They had met as activist students. Zhou once sent her a postcard with Robespierre on the front. Some day we two will meet together, he wrote on it, to confront the guillotine arm in arm. Committed entirely to the cause, Deng had her first pregnancy aborted without Zhou's knowledge. The second was lost during labour, when they were again on the run from Chang's executioners. The ordeal left her unable to have children, and so they adopted. Deng wasn't Zhou's first love interest. That was Zheng Ruo Ming. They also met as radical students, both spending time in prison for political activities at the time of the anti-imperialist May 4th movement. But while his time in prison only confirmed to Zhou that he was a through-and-through -through revolutionary, Zheng wasn't as devoted, and after moving to France for further studies, they drifted apart. Soon after, political infighting led her to abandon politics, and she focused on French literature, becoming the first woman to get a doctorate in literature in France. Later, she became a French literature teacher, but although she might have been finished with politics, politics was not finished with her. She was targeted much later after Mao Zedong's Hundred Flowers campaign, her son sent to a labour camp after writing criticisms about the direction that Mao was taking the country. Zheng was subjected to months of struggle sessions and eventually threw herself in the river and drowned. After the collapse of the Nationalist Communist Pact, known as the First United Front, which was the coalition of revolutionaries brought together to rid China of the warlords in the 1920s, Zhou became the head of the communist spy operation, infiltrating the nationalist ranks. It was a natural role for him. As a radical student leader, he had published newspapers and arranged boycotts against the Japanese. He had honed his talents in Europe and met many future communist figures like Deng Xiaoping and Zhu De, even Vietnam's Ho Chi Minh. Running spy operations out of Shanghai, he wore disguises and moved house frequently to avoid detection. It was a game of life and death. When one of his men was captured and gave secrets to the nationalists, Joe ordered the man's family be killed. In the name of revolution, Joe could be ruthless. But at core he was a mediator and a moderator. When those two generals kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek in an attempt to force a truce between the nationalists and the communists, Zhou went to do the negotiations. 
Afterwards, he tried to secure the safety of the nationalist generals. But Chiang was not the forgiving type. He had one killed along with his family, and kept the other as a personal prisoner for 40 years. But at least Joe tried. In 1939, Joe fell off a horse, badly hurt his arm, and went to Moscow for hospital treatment. His adopted daughter, Sun Wei Shi, went with him, and when he returned, she stayed in Moscow to study theatre. There, she met Lin Biao, the CCP's representative to the Comintern, and holder of China's most mysterious death award, which is a story for a later time. Lin fell madly in love with Sun, who at about 21 was 14 years younger than him. He offered to divorce his wife and be with her. Maybe she saw what a mess that would cause. Or maybe she just didn't like him, but she said no. Following the end of the Civil War, with the Communists victorious over the Nationalists and Zhou now the Premier of China, second only to Chairman Mao, his daughter, Sun, became a successful actor and producer in Shanghai, achieving a number of firsts in the world of modern Chinese theatre. She had an affair with the dashing actor Jin Shan, who left his wife for her. But Jin got himself into hot water while on a trip to North Korea for an acting job. He slept with one of Kim Il-sung's secretaries and was expelled from the country. The scandal threatened to have him put before the firing squad until Zhou Enlai stepped in and saved him. In the fledgling years of communist China, Sun Weixie had picked a dangerous career. But it wasn't because of her boyfriend's antics. Also on the scene in China's theatre world was Jiang Qing, Madame Mao. When Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the new China in 1949, Zhou was right there next to him. The two had been in it together since almost the beginning, and in the old days, Zhou was the superior. That was ancient history now. There was no disputing who was the boss. Zhou was the young to Mao's yin, the Paul McCartney to Mao's John Lennon. Mao clung to the wisdom of the peasant, while Zhou saw the value of intellectuals. Mao only left China twice in his whole life, both times to the Soviet Union. But Zhou went everywhere. Mao was inconsistent and stubborn, while Zhou was deliberative and flexible. Mao was a poet, while Zhou was an irreplaceable administrator, diplomat and tactician. He was so good that it annoyed Mao. Zhou could use Mao's lofty words to actually get things done, even deploying them to keep Mao himself in check. Throughout all of Mao's purges, Zhou kept his place by being competent, by offering self-criticisms when needed, and knowing what Mao was going to do, even before Mao himself knew it. But the Cultural Revolution took even Zhou by surprise. Never in my wildest dreams did I think anything like this could occur, he said. Whenever I think about it, shivers go down my spine, and my whole body breaks out into a cold sweat. Although there were ideological factors at play, such as following the great Marxist notion of permanent revolution, Mao embarked on the great proletarian cultural revolution for the most cynical of reasons. President Liu Xiaoqi disagreed with him about just how bad the Great Leap Forward had been and how to put it right. We looked at the Great Leap Forward in episode 3, pumped and deflated, but even without revisiting the darkness of those years between 1958 and 62, Rest assured that there was nothing great about the Great Leap. The moderates, like President Liu Xiaoqi, knew it. Mao's ego was bruised, and his grip on power threatened, and he resolved to put an end to this troublesome president. Zhou, a natural pragmatist, tried to work out a way to adopt Liu's ideas without bruising Mao's ego. And later, as political realities changed, to condemn Liu's ideas without destroying him. As the Cultural Revolution gathered pace, Mao's cult of personality went into overdrive. Billions, yes, billions, of Chairman Mao badges, portraits and little red books were made. Mao's quotations were scrawled into walls and shrieked from public squares. New songs blared out from loudspeakers, while loyalty dances dedicated to the great helmsman were the only dances permitted. When a gift of mangoes was given to Mao by Pakistan's foreign minister, Mao passed them on to a university, the mangoes themselves soon became fetishized as some kind of fruity representation of the great leader. They were put on plinths until they rotted, and then replicas were made and sent around the country. In one village, a dentist was unenthusiastic, comparing the mouth shape to a sweet potato. He was executed by a shot to the head. Ironically, Mao didn't even particularly like fruit. On a side note... China's current dictator Xi Jinping often visits small towns across China in carefully staged events, 
and with a little sprinkling of the Jinping magic, these towns are said to have a miraculous uptick in their fortunes. He recently went to a town in the countryside in Hebei, where he gave the locals the idea of growing different sized potatoes, and another community was saved. Xi's cult of personality is never going to hit the heights of Mao's, I just can't see it happening. But this stuff is one of the reasons that comparisons are made. Anyway, back to Joe and the Cultural Revolution. Mao's plan was to, quote, achieve great order under heaven by creating great chaos under heaven. He got fully behind the Red Guards as they rampaged through the country, famously exhorting them to bombard the headquarters and attack anything considered bourgeois, like cats. Millions of cats were killed, which is surprising considering Mao's name. A little language lesson to explain this. Mandarin Chinese has four tones. Flat, rising, falling and rising, and falling. Cat in Chinese is Mao, which has a flat tone. And Mao Zedong's name is Mao, which has a rising tone. Two words separated by a different tone, close enough to be a pun, but not close enough to save the cats. The Red Guards attacked people and institutions on behalf of the Great Helmsman murdering many and driving others to suicide. The city of Wuhan saw a full-scale battle involving hundreds of thousands of people split along political and military lines. In Shanghai, 120,000 Red Guards split into rival groups and fought for control of one area of the city. In Guangxi, hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered during these years, and thousands of perpetrators went about eating the victims. There was no famine at this time. It had become a ritual. Working within the maelstrom, Zhou found ways to protect high-profile targets from persecution, such as Sun Qingling, the widow of the revered father of the Republic, Sun Yat-sen. He implored the Red Guards to denounce with words, not violence. On many occasions, though, words were simply not enough. He was the Chinese premier, a powerful man, but he was up against the Central Cultural Revolution Group, headed by Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, and she had no qualms about violence. In the run-up to the Cultural Revolution, Zhou had produced a theatrical musical detailing Mao's glorious ascent, called The East is Red. He cut out the parts of history where it was he, and not Mao, who drove the revolution forward. And he had his adopted daughter Sun Weishu, and her husband Jin Chan, produce a play about oil workers, called The Rising Sun. But when Jiang Qing got her hands on the levers of cultural output, she set about instilling the cult of Mao in the popular imagination with propagandist theatre and began making moves against her rivals. Jiang was gunning for Zhou. As the chaos swirled around him, consumed with stress, doing what he could do to save his skin and the skins of his comrades, Zhou had a heart attack. With the moderating premier weakened, the turmoil threatened to rip the country apart. Red Guards attacked the British diplomatic compound in Beijing, and a forged letter purported to have been written by Zhou was unearthed and given to Mao as evidence of his treachery. Mao's treatment of President Liu Xiaoqi proved that he could turn on anyone, but Zhou knew that if anyone could stop the country falling into the abyss, it was him. For the country's sake, he had to stay in Mao's little red good books. He had to stay in Mao's good books. Perhaps that's why he made the ultimate sacrifice, signing off on the arrest of his adopted daughter, Sun Weishu. By this time, Sun's brother Sun Yang had become the head of Renming University in Beijing, but he was accused by Jiang Qing of being a spy and tortured to death in the basement of the university. Jiang's behaviour towards Sun Weishu was altogether more sadistic. Sun had produced some work which ticked the boxes of the party, but at heart she was an artist, not a propagandist. Jiang had wanted to make Sun's drama The Rising Sun into a Beijing opera, i.e., part of the propaganda effort, but Sun had refused. But this isn't really why she was targeted. Jiang had always been upstaged by the younger, more beautiful, more talented Sun. She got better parts than Jiang. She produced respected work. Lin Biao had loved her, and it's said that so too did Mao. Jiang Qing targeted Sun out of bitter, petty jealousy, and there was no one to stop her. Jiang had Sun's name changed from Wei Shi to Wei Shi. Very similar sound, but different characters. Her new name meant Sun the Hypocrite. She ordered that Sun be raped and tortured, and after seven months of that, Sun died. 
Jung ordered the cremation before Joe could get the autopsy done. Joe and Lai was not purged during those days of madness. After years trying to save Liu Xiaoqi's skin, he finally signed the papers that expelled him from the party and delivered a speech condemning him at the party congress. Not long after, Liu died a horrible death in prison. At the end of the decade, Joe managed to convince the chairman to start winding things down, although the Cultural Revolution lingered on basically until Mao died in 1976. For that entire time, the top of Chinese politics was consumed with the internal war between Jiang Qing and the leftists, and the more moderate forces led by Zhou and Deng Xiaoping. The great puppet master Mao chopped and changed as his paranoias and prejudices switched about. In the middle was Lin Biao, the top army man who had fallen in love with Sun Weishu. But in promoting the Cultural Revolution, he had helped create the circumstances which killed her. Lin, perhaps by accident, managed to become Mao's successor. A dangerous place to be. The mood turned sour and, once again, Joe tried to mediate. Once again, someone ended up dead. But as I said, that's a story for another time. Joe struggled with Mao's insatiable appetite for purging right up until the end. As the Cultural Revolution span out of control, Joe had worked behind the scenes to improve relations with that capitalist monstrosity, the United States. The antipathy between these two ideological enemies had been mutual. At the 1954 Geneva Conference, Joe had been snubbed by the anti-communist American diplomat, John Foster Dulles, who refused to shake his hand. But Joe always played the longer game. The thawing of relationships provoked anger from hardliners in both countries. But in 1972, US President Nixon visited Beijing, looked into the eyes of the ageing despot Mao Zedong, and declared him human. But having achieved a detente with the USA, Joe was blamed for capitulating to the imperialists, even by the erratic Mao whose ego was bruised. People abroad and at home thought Joe was just great. As Henry Kissinger put it, in some 60 years of public life I have encountered no more compelling figure than Joe and Lai. This kind of stuff made Mao's blood boil. Joe, now an old man struggling with cancer, endured 10 long days of criticism where he castigated himself for mistakes he knew he hadn't made. But Mao pulled back before the end and decided not to destroy the man who had been unwaveringly loyal for 40 years. He just instructed that the cancer went mostly untreated, and soon it became terminal. Only in his final moments did Joe come off the fence. In hospital he cried out in defence of his reputation, and also expressed his remorse to Deng Xiaoping, who had also fallen victim to Mao's cruelty, telling him that he had been the stronger one. How he felt about the more personal tragedies we'll never know but Joe harboured a deep guilt for not being able to stop so many comrades falling. His final political machinations were all designed to leave Deng in a position of strength. When Joe died in January 1976, he was resented by Mao, but adored by Chinese people within the party and across the nation. After Mao's death later that year, Jiang Qing and her allies were arrested. The trials were shown on TV, a message to the country that a line was being drawn in the sand. The gang of four were charged with having persecuted 727 420 people and causing the deaths of 34,274. Curiously precise figures for an event which was so widespread and complex. Jiang Cheng fired her lawyers and defended herself, not uttering a shred of remorse for her crimes. She held abuse at the judges and the witnesses and had to be restrained. At the end, with the cameraman's lens just a few feet from her face, she was sentenced to death and manhandled out of the room. The sentence was later changed to life in prison. She hanged herself in hospital ten years later, leaving a suicide note which blamed Deng Xiaoping for stealing away the revolution. But it wasn't just Deng who had the last laugh. From the grave, Zhou Enlai may have granted himself a wry smile for the victory of the moderates, or at least a sigh of relief. Deng rehabilitated many of those people targeted in the Cultural Revolution, or if they were dead... He rehabilitated their reputations and works. Sun Wei Shi's husband, Jin Shan, had endured seven years inside and only found out about his wife's death after coming out. Their last play, The Rising Sun, appeared in theatres and was sometimes even used as a way to criticise Jiang Qing's Gang of Four. Now, in China's hyper-communist age, it all seems like a distant memory. But these vast tragedies are only a couple of generations old and are seared into the collective consciousness despite 
not really being talked about. Xi Jinping, a child of the Cultural Revolution, whose own family was one of the many to suffer during those years, has now risen to the top of China's political pyramid. He has ended one of the government's moderating policies, that of term limits, giving himself the opportunity to be dictator until death if he so chooses, with all the potential for despotism that that implies. If she is the new Mao, as some suggest, then who is the new Zhou Enlai, we might wonder? The one who knows she better than he knows himself. The one who might put the brakes on if the train starts to derail. The ruthlessness that we find in high office doesn't remain in the political sphere. Sadly for many young Chinese who are entering the workplace, the discovery tends to be that the torturous struggle that defined their educational years simply takes on a new form at work. Young Chinese are responding to this reality in interesting ways that we'll attempt to cover in a future episode, with concepts such as lying down and let it rot. In the daily grind, low-level survival skills are still needed. Workplaces are rife with power plays and one-upmanship. As a teacher in Changshu's Cradle of Elites, I was naive about all this. But unbeknownst to me, a new guy was on his way to the school. And he turned out to have all the answers. And he turned out to have all the answers. But next time I'm stuck in the Middle Kingdom with you, we're going to direct our attention outside the Middle Kingdom for a change. And have a couple of episodes about Maoism around the world. Yes, we've done a fair bit about the craziness of the Cultural Revolution in China, but Maoism was a global phenomenon, manifesting in different ways in different places. It's a huge topic, but it's worth exploring a little bit. So that's next time. Take care. Bye-bye.